I was looking to find out what the five stupidities <laughs> the are. The five stupidities, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's intriguing. Um, okay, before I go into that, let me tell you this little story first, because I think this is a good place to start. A man and his son were coming home from a soccer game one Saturday afternoon, and they were involved in a head-on collision. The father was killed instantly. The son was taken to a nearby hospital in critical condition. Uh, they wheeled him up into the operating room. The surgeon walked in, took one look at the boy, and said, I can't operate on him. That's my son. So that's the story. Is there a problem with that story? Uh, is that simple? Um, what's going on with that story? It's confused me, if I'm honest. <laughs> Good. That's the point. Listen, I've told this story to many thousands of people over the years, and nobody has, I mean, that's the standard response that I get from everybody, is there's some problem with that story. But what I want to emphasize is the reason there is an apparent problem with that story is because I chose my words very carefully and one of the words there carries an unconscious assumption with it and that assumption is incorrect in this case but because the assumption is unconscious your analysis of the story is colored by this unconscious erroneous assumption and as long as that assumption remains in place, then this will continue to be paradoxical and problematic. But because of the unconscious assumption that you're operating on, it appears to be a problem. Does that make sense? I mean, I don't suppose that has answered it for you, but you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, I do, I do. There's, um, okay. The way I've um, interpreted the story is incorrect because of the language. Yes, right, absolutely. And the problem is that it's an unconscious assumption that's coded in language, okay? Uh, I could have talked a, a, another, well, in this case, probably not. But, but, uh, and in fact, this is sort of a trivial example, but it, it, but it brings the emotional point home of the feeling that you're having of confusion and this paradox and what's going on and the, the need to solve the problem, when in fact there is no problem to be solved. It's an apparent problem created by an erroneous assumption. So let me lead you through the logic of this story. And the logic is so obvious. It's it's painful when you see it. Well, of course, this is less true than it used to be. But today, uh, in, in 2010, uh, most people have two parents, one male, one female. If the male is dead, the surgeon is who? Yes, the, the surgeon is obviously the female. Yes, it's his mother. The most yeah. obvious thing in the world. The yeah. most simple and, yeah. and trivial idea. And yet, the word surgeon carries this assumption of maleness with it. Now, we weren't ever taught that that's true. And, of course, it is true statistically. Probably, I don't know, 90%, maybe 95% of surgeons probably are men. But uh, so it's not it's not a bad assumption uh, in, under certain circumstances. But uh, in this particular case, it creates the illusion of a paradox. But instead of people looking to their own assumptions to solve a problem, they usually end up looking in the world for the solution and never question their own assumptions. And so what Gendo is about and what the five stupidities are all about are about unconscious assumptions, unconscious erroneous assumptions that are imposed on our thinking because of the words we use. So the five stupidities, each one of them, uh, in some cases a specific word or a group of words or a class of words, impose assumptions, erroneous assumptions on our thinking, but because it's all unconscious, uh, People just go through life facing all sorts of apparent problems and paradoxes and things that really aren't paradoxes at all, but they are. Uh, they appear have that appearance because people have this little voice in their head that's uh, talking at them, and it's full of erroneous assumptions. So, does all that make sense? It's so simple when it's pointed out. And that's that's yes, of course. Very, very <laughs> yeah. Let me let me go on to the first and most dangerous of the uh, five stupidities. Then, um, yep. This word is the most common word in English. Do you know what it is? The. Yes, 
Right. Very good. How did you know that? I just, because there are a lot of, uh, well, it's obviously, so we use it in nearly yeah. every sentence. A, a, a th- so. Yes, a thousand times a day we formulate sentences with the word the in them. Most people, uh, well, yeah, I mean, usually people land on that, but I get I. I is a common word, and, and there are some other common words, but the is without a doubt. I mean, it's like five times more frequent than the next most common word. It accounts for 6% of all printed English text. That's six words in 100 in a language that has 30,000 words in common usage and 500,000 or more total. One word accounts for three in 50. And, and in fact, it's carrying an unconscious assumption with it that is wrong about 90% of the time. Well, occasionally it's right, but usually it's wrong. So rather than me just tell you what it is, I'm curious if you can, if you can think about the word the for a minute and, and try to figure out what it is that's such, uh, so dangerous about that word. What is the unconscious assumption? It, it defines things. It gives it a certain definition when the, yeah. the, the definition can be well basically it, I, I'm finding it hard to articulate I think I've got the, the grasp of that but yeah I think you do too but you, uh, let me give you some specific words let me give you another example um, if I tell you to go into the into the next room and get me the green chair how many green chairs do you expect to find in that room yeah, I mean, if if there's if there's more than one green chair, then which you'd one? be confused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. So, so when I say otherwise, I'd say get me a green chair. Yeah, yeah. right. So if, if so it, the word the carries this assumption of singleness and exclusivity. If you say get me the car out of the garage, well, I hope there's only one car in the garage, or else we're going to have a problem. You know, and the other thing is, uh, have you ever done any computer programming? No, no, I haven't. No, okay. Um, the reason I ask is be- because, well, you've probably worked with databases, though. Like, I remember a long time ago um, when I first got a computer, you know, I made a database of all the people I knew, you know, and I'd add new people in there. And in a, de- in a database, they have an option called a default value. For instance, in, since I lived in California and almost everybody I knew lived in California, uh, whenever I added somebody to my address book, when I got to the place where it said state, my uh, database program would automatically put California in there for me. I mean, I told it to do that I, because I, I knew that almost everybody I knew was in California. Once in a while, I'd meet somebody from out of state, and I'd have to backspace over CA and type in something else, if AZ for Arizona or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But, but it saved me a great deal of time. Uh, probably because because ninety five percent of the time it was right, <laughs> okay, and once in a while it was wrong, and that wasn't much of a problem. Uh, so that's the concept of a of a uh, default value, okay. Well, language English has default values. For instance, I, the, I'm as I talk to you right now, there certainly isn't time for me to sit here and and be thinking what I'm actually going to say in my next sentence and deciding what words I'm going to pick and uh, how I'm going to articulate them and and, and get my breathing worked up so that I could, you know, put the stresses on the right syllables and get all the words strung together in the right order so it actually sounds like a real sentence and, uh, and, you know, get my tongue and my larynx all coordinated with all this shit. There's, There's no way that that can happen consciously. So essentially, my talking and your talking and everybody's talking is really uh, an automatic function of our language machine. Uh, we, we, have some, we have this feeling of some control over it, but actually on a moment-to-moment basis, it's actually all being run by a machine, uh, with, which has a lot of default values. And if you are using a sentence that requires either a or an or the, you know, to be proper in English, certain words have default values to the. You've probably never heard anybody ask you, uh, well, what's a truth about this uh, this situation? <laughs> I, I can almost bet you've never heard those words come out of anybody's mouth. 
Yeah. Am I am I right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And in yeah. fact, actually, if you say it yourself, if you say yourself out loud, what's a truth about this situation? Go ahead and say it. I'm curious. I want to test something. What What's a truth about this situation? When you said what's a truth, yeah. I bet at least for me, it it just almost sticks in my throat. Yeah. I want to say what's the truth about this situation. Yeah, yeah I was consciously trying yeah, to say you, a, even yeah, it yeah, because if, to yeah, that. yeah, because if yeah. you're not really conscious, it's just automatically going to come out what's the truth without yeah. ever thinking. So this is what I mean by default values in English. Uh, now the question is. Is there any such thing as the truth, for instance, about uh, this, uh, well, say I've got a, uh, a ball on my table, and does it make, and that's simple, a ball, but I mean, that's about as simple a thing as you can get, but is, does it make sense to ask about what's the truth about this ball? I mean, if I say it's a red ball, is that the truth or a truth? I suppose it's a truth because if it's the truth, then it's all it is is a red ball. It could be it prevents it from being anything else. So it could be, well, it prevents it from being a, a wooden ball or a rubber ball, or a big yeah. ball or a small ball. So <laughs> I, I think I'm getting what you're saying. So what it does is when you're using the or instead of say the truth instead of a truth, is that when you say the truth. It can only be that and nothing else. So uh, yes. another example I can use is say we one thing we say is the universe when it's ah, actually yes. <laughs> a universe because um, because we yeah. don't know what what else is out That's there. We right. only know what, yeah. what modern science tells us. So it, it, it isn't. We're saying the universe. That's all it actually well, is. What about the reason? What about the reason? What's the reason uh, that something happened? Yeah, yeah. Nonsense. There's no such thing as the reason, the truth. Uh, what about the answer? What's the answer to? Uh, in fact, what's the? If I said, what's the answer to two plus two? Or no, let's say one plus one. Uh, is that proper to say what's the answer to one plus one? In that case, there is only there's only one answer to. Really? One plus one. Well, I don't know. Really? Necessarily. Only one? Are you sure? I think it says. I'm trying to think. Uh, obviously, I don't know what the answer is. I'm just trying to work out how it is that answer. Um, well, let me. No, let me. Uh, if you're if you haven't done programming and you don't know a lot about computers, it wouldn't be obvious. But there are different base systems in math. We use binary math in computers. In computers, one plus one equals ten. Oh, I see. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. So it depends on what base system you're using. The answer to that question. If you're using regular old base systems, uh, base ten, then one plus one equals two, and that is the answer in base ten. But in base in a binary system, one plus one equals ten, and that's the answer in uh, in binary. Yeah. So. Um, so even that, even that, there's an assumption underlying these things that is often unspoken. One plus one equals two is assuming base ten, which is a logical assumption. The problem is when you get into science and philosophy and politics and stuff, there are far more complicated situations where the assumptions are less obvious and uh, more complex and just gets into all sorts of problems. So, and how often have you heard people say, well, that's just the way it is? <laughs> oh, too many times I've heard that. Yeah, yeah. And is that ever the truth? No. No. All it ever is is a way of thinking about it. Yeah. But, you, you know, you don't want to, I mean, if your boss is telling, see, sometimes it's the way it is because your boss is your boss, and and if he says it's that way, then it is because he's the guy who gets to make up the rules. But it's only that way because he says it's that way, not because it is that way. If your boss tells you to go find the answer to this problem, and then you go off and you start thinking and you come up with an answer, but you think it's the answer, well, then you can stop looking. You found the answer. But if you'd looked five minutes longer, you might have found five more answers that were even better, <laughs> you know.
So yeah, yeah it, ten, it tends to end discussion, end exploration, and it also is used very dogmatically to, uh, like I say, in the case of that's just the way it is, that's, you know, that's the world. The world really is that way, and this is it, and there's no more discussion. People use it from a sort of authoritarian perspective. But of course, the thing is, people don't actually use it. That's the problem, is that, like I said before, my talking right now, I mean, it's as much a surprise to me what's going to come out of my mouth in the next sentence as it is to you. I have no idea exactly what I was going to say. And, and my language machine is busy uh, putting all this shit together for me. And yeah. the, the default value in English is the for a great many words. In fact, all these reifications that I'll get into in a minute. So that's the, the reason the word the is so important is because it happens hundreds of times a day. You know, that little voice in your head is going all the time. Blah, 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 blah. It's rehearsing what it's going to say when it sees somebody. It's thinking about what yeah. it should have said when I, when I saw this guy yesterday, but I didn't. And it's thinking about what I'm going to have for lunch and what I'm going to do next week. And, and, you know, it's just this constant thing that's going on inside of our language machines. And the word the is just popping through there all the time and it permeates our consciousness it gives us this false sense of security that we know the answer that we know the truth the reason the explanation and we can sort of go through the, our lives in this sort of illusory sense of security that there's no justification for whatsoever it's it's actually a, a disability yeah. it? oh, you got it yeah it's a form of mental illness. It's, well, it's a form of brain damage, as I see it. And that's why I tell people uh, that they're brain damaged, and so am I, but I'm in language rehab. I've been working pretty hard to reprogram my language machine so that whenever the word the comes out of my language machine, I usually hear it. Sometimes I don't, but I usually do. And, and then I, when I hear it, I can, then I'm in a position to decide whether I'm, you know, it's incorrect or correct. See, sometimes the word uh, is correct. It's not always wrong. But my studies indicate that it's wrong about 90% of the time. Yeah. 90% of the time, uh, if we used a or an or some other kind of construction, that it would leave the situation far more open and, uh, and useful for thinking. So that's, that's the number one stupidity, and actually that's enough in itself to bring about the change, I think. I mean, the other ones are minor compared to that one. I'm at stage one in this. I can admit I've got the problem. That's the first stage. Yeah, to yeah, yeah, that's the first. And, and I'll tell you how you can proceed. There's a very simple way to proceed. Now that you know it and you have acknowledged that you're brain damaged and, and that it is possible to do something about your brain damage, what you can do is... If there's any politician or philosopher or religious person on the media that you can listen to that you don't like, well, then listen to them and record it, actually, and, and listen to the way they use the word the. Well, like I say, if it's someone you don't like, then you're more prone to hear this stuff. <laughs> You begin to train your brain to hear the, hear these words. So you don't have to really listen to their argument. You just listen to the word the. And then when you hear it, then play it back and listen to that part. And then ask yourself, did they consciously choose to use that word? Or did their language machine just put it together that way for them because that's the way they're programmed? And then they believed it because that's yeah. what came out of their mouth. And therefore, it must be yeah. true. And their brain damage, like the rest of us, is not like they're evil. They were damaged when they were children by their parents, by being taught English the way uh, they were taught and the way we've all been taught. You can spend a couple of weeks doing this, uh, just, you know, maybe uh, 10, 15 minutes a day. You know, there are plenty of places on the Internet where you can listen to people on YouTube and stuff. <laughs> Uh, and spend like 10 minutes a day just listening to, to people that you disagree with and listen to the way they use the word the. the. The reason I suggest that is because if you do that for a couple of weeks, well, and, and it may not even take a couple of weeks. It may not take any time at all because eventually what's going to happen is you're going to start hearing it coming out of your own mouth. And that's when you know you're, uh, you're beginning to really get it. It's easy to hear somebody else abuse the but you already caught yourself once using it so that's the thing is is begin to notice how your own language machine automatically throws the word the in there for you 
And there's just, well, there is a lot you can do about it. You can begin to reprogram your language machine, but it begins by becoming aware of it and actually getting that that voice in your head isn't you. That voice in your head is just your language machine, and it's been badly programmed. And uh, once you begin to observe it and pay attention to it, that puts you in a position to uh, to reprogram it yourself so that either the word the doesn't come up as often, or when it does come up, and this is really good enough, when it does come up, uh, you hear it and are prepared to uh, reformulate it if it's if it's important or necessary. And you can just see how people use it to justify their self-righteousness when they think they know the truth. You know, yeah. they know how the world really is, the way it is, uh, the answers, the you know, the explanations. And um, I think you use a great example of Alex Jones. There, he's. I'm going to certainly. I think the first thing I can do is it is because he he thinks he has all. All the, the answers. And, yes, he knows the <laughs> truth. Just yeah, ask him. <laughs> for example, he thinks everything that's going wrong is the elite. Or well, maybe that one of the specific things are wrong are done by a elite, not the elite. Yes, any number of elite groups. Yeah, the whole idea yeah, yeah, that there's, there's one there's, group that's, out there it's, that's it's, running everything is it's absurd. Ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yes. I mean, there, there, there are. Plenty there of, are thousands uh, of elites yeah. all competing yeah, yeah. and trying to control everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, perhaps, you know, perhaps, um, well, Alex Jones needs to go on a, a gender course anyway, doesn't he? <laughs> oh, and it's pronounced Gendo, actually. It's a oh, hard sorry, G. Sorry. Gendo. That's oh, all right. No problem. Gendo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I've, 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 um, I understand. I'm, I've, to be honest, I've never... Um, thought of it like that so that's good well of course none of us have i didn't invent this myself i actually read this in a book uh i think one of the most important books that's ever been written and uh, well it's on uh, jacques a reading list it's a book called science and sanity by alfred korzybski everybody i know who has read the book agrees that it's one of the 10 most important books that have ever been written another book i want to read is uh, the tyranny of words is that a lot of people talk about that as well yeah that's sort of a warmed over reaction to science and sanity uh Korzybski was his teacher Right, I see. And that book wouldn't have been. I mean, it's a good book, and it and it's good in the sense that it's not difficult. Uh, Korzybski's book, uh, unless you're a good reader, some people are readers, and some people have trouble with difficult reading. You know, so, so it, it makes a difference. But uh, Korzybski's book is a little bit difficult, and it's long. It's like 850 pages, and um, the tyranny of words is very good, though. You're right. That might be a good place to start. You don't actually. You don't really need to read Korzybski. I just brought it up because uh, he mentions in there sort of in passing the word the without really going into it but when i read that and started thinking about it i realized how how prevalent that is and and how well and of course korzybski was writing in 1930 so i mean that was in a whole different universe almost a hundred years ago now yeah so like, um, like anything else language evolves as well doesn't it even though it is still you know we're still using very um you know um i don't know pre prehistoric let's say uh, language it, it does evolve still um, yeah yeah, but yeah. The principles are still still the same as what they've been for hundreds of years yeah yeah it, but it, but his the style of writing in 1930 was quite different and uh, so uh, I think uh, Chase wrote his book in maybe in the 40s or 50s I don't remember now so you know his style and Korzybski you know was a, a from the aristocracy in Poland he was a Polish mathematician and engineer uh, and he was Count Alfred Korzybski so he was from an you know one of the the aristocracy of Poland so uh, you know his style was a little strange I guess for most Americans yeah but but, but in any case, he was the first guy that, that were, who had written about the word the. And he didn't seem to give it much importance. But uh, And I didn't at the time. I noticed it and I thought it was. But it wasn't maybe for 20 years later that all of a sudden I started. I don't know how I came into all this stuff. But I, I realized that that single word uh, just just colored everybody's view of, of their understanding of the world. And how dangerous that little word really is. Well, let me give you the other four stupidities because they're relatively simple and don't require, well, three of them are really simple and don't require any uh, real explanation. Uh, they're also quite common. Actually, before I do that, I want to get 
Um, I want to get a URL and put it in here. Hold on. The URL is www.cameroff.net slash heron slash twm slash. And that's Kamarov, K-A-M-A-R-O-V dot net slash Heron, H-E-R-O-N, slash T-W-M slash. And you can follow along in the discussion that follows about reification. Okay, um, if you'll go to that link, what I want to talk about is one of the stupidities uh, called reification. Okay. So, yeah, pick, pick, I'll, I'll actually do the test. And, it, and it'll say do it for you, so you don't actually have to randomly okay. pick them. If you just say okay. do it for me, it'll uh, it'll do it anyway. Okay, yeah. Uh, and now, if you would read that, I'd be interested to see what it says. Okay, yeah, it's, uh, the title is uh, The Wisdom Machine, Superstition and Judgment. There is no coherence without tradition. The time fast approaches when production will no longer be able to withstand the forces of humility. Until now, people have been content with mere truth, but now we must move beyond temptation to equilibrium. For we must always remember that the fundamental force behind simplicity is not defiance, but virtue. And of course, we all know that the convergence of uh, participation and insanity leads inevitably to greater faith. The age of reason has arrived. Which side are you on? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. I like that yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, now the reason this works is uh, this is this is an example of the problem of what I call reif. Or I didn't make this word up. Somebody I don't even know where the word came from. The, the word the word is reification, and what it talks about is there's a problem in the noun structure of English. Uh, y- do you remember what you were taught? Uh, about what a noun is when you were in grammar school. In America, we were taught a, a very specific little mantra. A noun is a person, place, or thing. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's, that, and that's so it's like almost it. everybody in America will just automatically regurgitate, oh, a noun is a person, place, or thing. Yeah. But that's just simply not true. It depends on how you want to define the word thing. See, uh, I would say that in order for something to be a thing, then you have to be able to put it in a bucket. It may be a big bucket, like a mountain is a thing, and, but it, if you had a big enough bucket, you could put the mountain in the bucket. But words like these in this reification problem, novelty, science, judgment, compulsion, reality, tragedy, illusion, those are not things. Yeah. There is no such thing as love. There's no such thing as knowledge. There are, uh, those are words, just like the word, uh, you know, spoon is a word that refers to this thing on my desk here. Okay. But the word, and then we have these other words like knowledge and reality, but there is no thing that you can point to and say, that's, uh, there's humility because it's a, it's a word of a different order of reality. It's a, it's about relationships between things, not about things themselves. Okay. I'll but the problem yeah. is in English, that distinction is lost and people get into arguments about what democracy is, or what science is, or what truth is, or any of these things. When in fact, see, if you and I have an argument about my spoon here, well, I'll bet you yeah. any argument you and I have about this spoon, if you and I were both here in the room together with this spoon, we would have no more argument. You know, because we will be able to yeah. resolve that argument by looking at the spoon itself and deciding, uh, you know, what makes sense. But if we have an argument about uh, democracy or freedom or the future or uh, economy or any of, number of thousands and thousands of English words, uh, there's no there's no way to settle the argument because there is no thing uh, to for recourse to. But because oh, people, but because people don't think about it in those terms, people actually, people actually look for love the way they look for their keys. <laughs> you know, like Which, there yeah, is that's, some that's such yeah. thing as yeah. love. Then somehow, or they wonder, they ask themselves, "I think I'm falling in love," or "I think I'm in love." Like, 
like there's some objective yeah. <laughs> you know oh yep now he's in love he, he went over the edge now he's in love you know <laughs> it's just it, it, this is all part of the fantasy world that we live in these illusions these relationships between things are treated as though they're things in themselves with their own properties independent of our evaluation and that's just simply not true that's about as crazy as you can get and that wisdom machine thing all you got to do is listen to Alex Jones or any philosopher or any politician and they love these kinds of words they're they're full of emotions and people respond to these things but they have no actual meaning at all it's almost yeah. like if I say uh, x plus 7 equals 10 yeah. Is that true or it's, false? Well, it's not true yeah. or false. As long as X is in there, it's just it doesn't mean it's, anything. Is the, 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 these words are labeling things that we don't understand? Not things. No, they're not things. That's exactly sorry. the point. Wrong, wrong I know. We, it's that, awesome. it's well. No, it's, don't feel bad because it's hard to talk about it. How else do you talk about it? We say, well, they're they're things that aren't things, but they're not <laughs> things. They don't even exist. See, what they are is words. This is really quite simple. If someone wants to know what love is. It's real easy. Love is a word. Love is a word that people use to mean all sorts of things. <laughs> and that's, you know, and it depends what do you mean when you use the word love. I love pizza and I love my dog. And uh, I mean, there's lots of the word love means whatever you want it to mean. But again, people don't think of it that way. People think that they know what these things really mean. They think they know what democracy really is as though democracy had a set of attributes like my spoon has a set of attributes democracy has no attributes that i don't give it in my own language machine so reification is uh, another one of the stupidities relatively easy one and if you notice if you look on that uh, that word list uh, yeah. many of those words have very clear noun endings that mark them as reifications they end in ty and cy and tion and uh, e ence and i mean they have, a lot of them have very uh, very typical uh, endings that that clue us into the fact that they are uh, reifications a good place to listen for all this stuff is um, especially the word the and reification is when somebody's having an argument if you disengage from the substance of their argument and and oh, that was what i was going to say also is that all these reifications the is almost always the default value for any one of them because we love the feeling of security it gives us. Ah, yeah. the, the resolution, the vitality, the evil in the world. Now I have the certainty or the happiness. A or and just so, somehow feels weak to us. We want to feel more secure than A or and. We like the. Did you have a question? These are things that, are, when you're exposed to it, are so blindingly obvious. Yeah. Uh, the thing yeah, is, yeah. you've already known everything I'm going to tell you, except for one of them, you already know. But the thing is, you don't know that you know it. And there's a yeah. big difference yeah. between knowing something yeah. and knowing that you know it. Now that you know these things, uh, it puts you in a whole different position. You I'm already knew this thing. It. Yeah, right. Yeah, Let me give you two now. more that are really obvious, way more obvious than this. That, but one we don't think about very often is dualism, two-valued logic. We love to divide the world up into two mutually exclusive opposites. Is he a good king or a bad king, daddy? You hear it all the time. Is it this or that? They, the word or is, the, uh, is the, the key. They present a choice between two mutually exclusive opposites. It must be one or the other. The problem with this is, and there are some cases where the world really is divided that way, but the problem is they project this two value, this dualism out into the world as though the world itself is actually divided into good and bad or light and dark or whatever. When in fact, two-valued logic is an aspect of my analysis, not the world itself. The world isn't divided into good and bad people. It's my analysis that goes out there and grabs people and puts them into one box or the other. The world itself isn't divided that way. It's an aspect of, of the system I use yeah. to analyze the world. So the problem with dualism and with the next one also is that we project our own thinking out into the world and then treat the world as though it's actually divided along the lines of our own analysis, which is just as crazy as you can get. Imagine if science was stuck with the concepts of hot and cold 
Well, duh. You know, I mean, that's okay. That, that, you know, if you live in a climate where it's really cold and you could say, is it cold or hot today? Well, you know, that might be all right. But for general descriptions or a first approximation, but for science, no, 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 no. You use, uh, a, you know, an infinitely graded uh, scale. And then you don't care whether it's hot or cold. It's 34 degrees centigrade. Who cares whether it's hot or cold? It's just what it is. So two-valued logic is well, another. Really I mean, that's two- it. Go ahead. Yeah, as I say, it creates us to pigeonhole things. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's either capitalism or it's communism. It couldn't be yes. something that's, um, you know, maybe could be a mix of both. You know, this is. Yes, it's, or it could yeah, be yeah. Uh, 3% capitalism, 14% socialism, and the rest a bunch of other shit that we don't even have names yeah. for. So, so then, where, <laughs> yeah. where, where, which pigeonhole is that in? You know, there is, yeah. there is yeah. one. Yeah, I'll yeah. See. yeah. yeah. It's, yeah again, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good debating technique, and people use it, again, because they'll try to divide the world into two really mutually exclusive opposites and make you choose between them, and then they set it up so one of them is just obviously stupid and wrong. So, <laughs> You only can really choose the one they want you to choose. <laughs> so it, anyway, yeah. th- that's a relatively <laughs> simple one. And you already yeah. knew this. But again, once you begin to see this, and, and especially as you listen to other people speak and you realize that it comes out of their mouths, out of their language machines, totally automatically, and th- but then they end up believing it themselves. They actually believe that the world is divided into good people and bad people or whatever situation they're in, they end up thinking that this projection of their own mind is projected out into the world, and then they treat the world as though it's really that way. And that's just crazy. One more thing on that is that, would you say then it's fair to say that our language has created our political systems in the sense where we in the UK have conservative or labor, or or you have Democrat or Republican? Would you say that's down to language? Um, nothing is ever quite that simple, <laughs> but no, right. but that's certainly part it's of it. Yeah. The thing is that language, reason. yeah, it's not the reason. Yes, very <laughs> good. Reason, yeah. But yeah, language touches every aspect of human behavior, family relationships, business, science, politics, religion. There's no area of, of human behavior that isn't touched by uh, the insanities of language. So yeah, it's there everywhere. Occasionally, two-valued logic is correct. It's almost never correct in the physical world, like in sciences, but it is often correct in the human-made world. For instance, it is true that you are either married or you are divorced. And and that act is defined as a certain legal thing. When a certain paper gets signed by somebody, you are married. And there's no in-between, there's nothing vague about it at all. You're married when that piece of paper gets signed. Now, maybe it's vague while you're signing the paper for two seconds. It's indeterminate. But once you've signed it, that's it. You are married. And then once you get a divorce a few years later, and once that paper gets signed by somebody, then you are no longer married. Um, even dead, see, uh, is, death is no longer that simple anymore. It used to be sort of simple, and sometimes it is. I mean, if you... If you're blown up by a stick of dynamite, I guess you're dead. There isn't much question about that. But, I mean, there are a lot of subtle cases now where it's not clear at all. But, again, in the human world of ideas and in mathematics and places like that, two-valued logic has a, has a place. In logic, in, in lots of places, two-valued logic is okay. It's just that it's not okay in almost all circumstances having to do with our sensory experience. It's almost never true. Okay, so we've covered three. The word the, which is the most important and obvious of them, reification, dualism, and the next one, again, is something obvious and simple as dualism. I mean, like I say, there's nothing you didn't already know about that. And there's same with the next one, absolutism. The words all, every, no, none. Anyone who says something about all uh, Frenchmen or all anything (laughs) is just nonsense it may be 99.5 percent absolutism is almost always wrong but uh, it is true in the human invented idea world uh, and in mathematics again where absolutes uh, can apply it's just that again when you're trying to talk about your experience in the real not the real world but the perceptual world uh, where absolutism fails 
almost always. I wouldn't say it's always wrong because <laughs> that would be a stupid thing to say. <laughs> but it's almost <laughs> always wrong. So that's a real simple one, though. And again, all of these things, uh, when you listen to Alex Jones, the two-valued logic, the, uh, the absolutism, the reification, the word the... And the beauty of this is you don't even have to begin to deal with the uh, the actual substance of an argument. You know, you can cut all sorts of nonsense without ever even looking at the substance of an argument. I mean, all these words invalidate whatever the hell they're talking about. It doesn't make any difference what they're talking about. Okay, so that's four. The fifth one is problematic, and it's not easy to uh, to explain. It's easy to tell you how to deal with it. And it's the concept of identity and the way it actually works. And this goes back to Alfred Korzybski's book, Science and Sanity, which is really the central idea or one of the central ideas. Listen to me, the central. <laughs> see it? Yeah. See how easy that just came out yeah. of my mouth? Yeah, yeah. It, just flew, it just flowed right out without me even but thinking. You, you're aware of it, though. So well, like, I did catch it, so that's, yeah. that's good. Yeah. But I mean, see, that's what I'm saying. That's what we're up against, how unconscious our language machine is. It just, after all the years that I've been working on this shit, that stuff still just comes flowing out of my mouth without any problem at all. Anyway, in earthling, English minus the five stupidities, there is no verb to be. The word is, am, are, was, all that, except as helping verbs occasionally, they're okay. But you can't really say what something is. And if you think about it for a minute, it becomes quite obvious. If, if, if you and I are driving down the street and you point to a tree and say, what is that? And I say, oh, that's um, a palm tree. What do you know now? about that tree that you didn't know before nothing nothing just, just all you uh, know is what it's called label. Label. yeah you you've been you've been told that i call that a palm tree but you don't know anything right. about it if you want to yes, know something about what that tree is you're probably going to have to go to wikipedia <laughs> you know and, yeah, yeah. and learn a little something and we say if i tell you my next door neighbor is an asshole <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, clearly he's not really an asshole, but uh, you, you know what I mean. But actually, if I told you that he beats up his wife and kids and his dog, and uh, he stays up till four o'clock in the morning playing loud polka music, and he hasn't mowed his lawn in six years. Now I've told you what he does, and now you have some sort of picture about what I'm trying to say. But to just say he's an asshole tells you nothing. The verb to be is kind of tricky, and it, there are actually four different varieties of the verb to be, depending upon how it's used in a sentence, and I don't even want to go into any of that here. And it's also, it also has some very heavy uh, philosophical implications when I talked about, I mean, I think the label for this is identity, and the very fact that I think that there is a me in here that's the same I that was here 10 years ago or when I was three months old and now that there's some identity, some me that is identical that flows through all of that that's the same now as it was then turns out to be, well, a nice little fiction that we've been living with for several thousand years. <laughs> But again, that's tricky stuff for adults. It's easy for kids to just learn not to use the verb to be and to instead of say what something is, to talk about what it does. And in fact, there is a thing called E prime by a guy named David Borland, who just died recently, I think. Uh, he was another student of Korzybski's who took Korzybski seriously and started doing his own writing without the verb to be. And he called uh, English minus the verb to be E prime. You can look up E prime on Wikipedia. Yeah. And he wrote uh, all of his stuff without the verb to be. And one of the things that's kind of interesting about it is that, uh, I mean, it sounds kind of difficult, but actually when you read stuff that's written in E prime, it's amazing how few questions come up. Everything is simple. So that is the grand tour of the five stupidities, the last one being the verb to be, uh, eliminating the verb to be from earthling, and uh, it's known as, I mean, the principle of identity. So you got uh, the word the, reification, dualism, absolutism, and identity. Those are the five stupidities. Yeah, 
it is so blindingly obvious that just <laughs> yeah yeah, it's yeah ne- that's ne- exactly I, well, I've, yeah. I've never but I'd never have thought about obviously I've always known about it say you know subconsciously but yeah you need to know that you know it yeah that puts you in a position and again it's almost horrifying as you as you develop you'll begin to hear yourself saying all the stupidest shit (laughs) and it really is humbling I'll tell you when when I realize you know the stuff that comes out of my mouth it's humbling but I've been working on this for years and I'm getting a little better but I'm still in rehab I I still think that I'm brain damaged and as as showed earlier when I talked about the main point of Korzybski's work. So it shows you that I'm still brain damaged. Because everyone else's language and speech has an influence on us, until the majority of people stop using it, it's, we're never going to be able to get out of it. And we don't need to. I think it's good enough that I catch myself. And of course, if your friends know about it, they can help you. You know, like Jason, yeah, I don't know if he's here or not right now, but he and I have been talking about this stuff for a couple of years now, and he occasionally catches me when I'm full of shit, and I catch him all the time when he's full of <laughs> shit. <laughs> but it's good because among a community of people, we can help each other. And I would also, by the way, I would highly recommend that you don't try to pull any of this shit on anybody about the word the or any of this shit. Uh, they'll just get angry. Unless you've got permission, unless they've asked you uh, for your opinion on all these things. If, if someone's abusing the word the and you start saying, well, but that's not the reason, you know, they're just going to think you're a complete idiot and they're going to be angry. So I would caution you to hold your tongue. Yeah, unless, unless I don't like them and then I can pull their argument out without even having to look at uh, or, or try and really... Yeah, um, yeah that's true too. Know what but ju- I'm just about. warning you. I'm, I'm very inquisitive, so I think I might have to just test it just to see. Well, yeah, actually, I'd be interested to see. Maybe it maybe it's just my own style that gets people pissed off. Maybe you can get away with it well, and they'll love I'm, you for I'm, it. I'm you know? certainly going to give it a go. But yeah. Well, try it on people you don't know very well. Don't try it on yeah. anyone that you really care about right yeah, away. No, because, I won't. Uh, I, won't. I, I think I'm going to try it with someone who, who I don't like. I think there you go. Or someone you just don't you just meet and you're never going to see them again or anything. You know? Yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah I don't one really of those care what their opinion is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I've just, I've just noticed. Just, um, our whole name, the Zeitgeist Movement, technically, is it not? We're not a Zeitgeist Movement. Well, no, I think that's probably correct. I think for right now, we probably are the Zeitgeist Movement until someone starts the second one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and then what do we do? <laughs> well, then we can be a Zeitgeist Movement or the first Zeitgeist Movement, yeah, and they can become go, yeah. the second Zeitgeist <laughs> Movement. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, see, the word the is appropriate sometimes. Listen, if you go blind in one eye, uh, it's possible that you'll go blind in the other eye. And that makes yeah. sense. And yeah. in fact, that particular example was the first time that I realized that I had actually reprogrammed my own language machine. I was a big fan of boxing for years, and there was a real famous boxer called Sugar Ray Leonard. I don't know if you I know, know him. Yeah, I do. Yeah. You, oh, you do know who he is? Okay. Well, anyway, he retired uh, because he had a detached retina in his eye and so he had to retire and then like two years later he'd had surgery on the eye he decided to to come back and start boxing again and a lot of people thought that was a really bad idea and I was explaining to somebody this and I said to the guy you know yeah a lot of people are worried that if he gets hit too much he already had it in one eye and he might get a detached retina in another one (laughs) <laughs> and that was what just automatically came out of my mouth. And the guy I was talking to looked at me like I was crazy. And I heard it come out, too. And I would look at I stopped, too. And the minute I heard it, another eye. How many eyes does this guy have? So there's a case where the would have been appropriate. But I actually had disrupted my normal functioning enough that that's what came out automatically from my language machine that time and I was so happy I mean I was just blown away that I'd actually said that but then again like still here this is like 20 years later and I'm still talking about the main purpose of Korzybski's book so it's a long job (laughs) yeah yeah but it's uh, admitting it is the first is a first step (laughs) <laughs> well, there may be such a thing as the first step, maybe. I, that I might think, be possible. I think in, the, in, this, in 
Because at the, the stages, <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to use it. I, I'm conscious of it, but I'm just going to Well, that's the thing is you're sort of stuck with it now. Yeah, so so yeah. we're going to see whether I have sufficiently infected you so that I the think, infection holds. Yeah, you know. it, it, it will. It will. Um, well, I'm really going to be looking forward to seeing uh, how, how the infection proceeds over the next couple of weeks and months. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know? I think what's going to happen now is that anyone I speak to, I'm going to be thinking, yeah, his language is, is you know, well, he's a victim of his language. Yeah, yeah. And, and tell me, the, 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 the best one, the best one, well, the most common one certainly is the word the. You hear it hundreds and hundreds of times a day, and it's almost always wrong. Sometimes it's not real far wrong. Sometimes it's just sort of maybe not that really important. And again, this kind of pickiness about language, I don't want to suggest that all of our communications need to, to be devoid of these things. For me, earthling is only important when I'm when I've got a problem to solve, when I'm actually trying to do some serious thinking. If I'm uh, out to dinner with some friends and we've had a couple glasses of wine and we're talking all sorts of stupid shit, I don't care about any of these things. They're, they're trivial. They don't make any difference. When this becomes important is when, when you're angry or when you're fearful or you're upset about something and there's some problem you're facing that you need to deal with, that's when this stuff is really important. Or in political discussions, like I say, all the people that are pundits that get on TV and analyze politics, this, those are the situations where this gets important. Uh, when you're bowling with your friends, it doesn't make any... I mean, it, it could. I mean, if an argument comes up, well, then maybe it, it would. But So most of the time, this stuff is not necessary. A good deal of the time, uh, life is going along okay, there aren't any problems, and you can say any dumb shit you want to, and it's not going to make any difference. Yeah. <laughs> so that's important to remember that. Uh, Earthling is not meant to replace wild English. Wild English, in fact, in Earthling, I probably wouldn't want to write poetry or love letters in Earthling. You are the most beautiful woman in the world. <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> to me, right now, this language stuff is important primarily when you need to do serious thinking. And if you're if you're smart, if your life is going relatively well, you shouldn't have that many problems. So you could you can afford to just say all sorts of stupid shit as long as it doesn't get you in trouble. But then the thing is, was the moment for me, see the way it works is the moment I find myself getting angry angry or fearful or upset for any reason. I mean, normally I'm okay, but every once in a while I notice that I'm unhappy about something. And, and so the cue is when I notice that I've got a problem. At that moment is when I switch into earthling. I start listening to my own language machine and inevitably what I find is that I've been caught up in some stupid story and swept along in this story and it's just full of all of these things. Yeah. And once you can make the, um, be able to analyze it in that way, the, the problem or whatever that it's made. It just you, disappears. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, and actually, once you break the identification with the voice, that's really it, is once you get that that voice isn't you, it's just your language machine, and that you've gotten caught up in it, sort of hypnotized. Like I say, I go in and out of that trance probably a hundred times a day or more. I'm swept up in it. But again, most of the time, things are okay. But when it malfunctions, then I get angry or something. And that's when I switch into Earthling and realize I got caught up in the story again. Would you think it's fair to say that it may be that Earthling or the change in our language, our language machine, is, is going to be one of the last things to change? Um, well, I don't know. I, I don't think it, I, I don't, I don't even think about it in la first or last. It's just one of the things that I think uh, the planet would be better off if people were uh, able to think clearly <laughs> without uh, unconscious uh, uh, yeah. assumptions. Yeah. And I think probably that's going to come out more through the next couple generations of children. There's really nothing in here that any 10 year old couldn't understand. And if a 10-year-old learns this before the age of puberty, then they will be inoculated for life uh, against certain kinds of stupidity and unconsciousness. So I think that that's really what I want to do is create curriculum for children. It's, it's really simple. You just have to say it a couple times and then reinforce it over a period of time. And kids will love this because, the, you know, they'll be able to call their adults on their own language use. <laughs> and once kids know this, they won't be fooled by all this nonsense. And uh, who knows what they could do then. 
as people get older, the the influence that the language machine will have is it gets stronger. Um, yeah. I'm presuming, but I'm well, just, actually, I don't think it gets strong. Well, maybe it's right. It's just that by the time most people are hit their early twenties, they're pretty much brain dead. They are set. The way I say it is, they're stuck in their story. They've got it. They've developed this story in in English in our cases, and that story isn't just the story that their language machine constructed. They actually think they know what reality really is, and and they feel comfortable with that. And to question that makes them very nervous. And so they just simply don't. If they have any questions that make them nervous, they turn on the television. That way they don't have to think about it. So I don't know if there are any more stuck, but my sense is that it is possible for someone above the age of 15 to actually totally transform the way they think. And that does happen. But it's just relatively rare for an adult to uh, have a, a real strong rebirth of identity. Although it does happen, and I suspect in the future it'll happen more and more as uh, the old system gets shakier and shakier. Some people will get more conservative, more stuck in their old ways, but other people will begin to re-examine things. So, uh, you know, we'll see. Yeah, there'll be a bigger, much bigger division. Right yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah the lines that. will get drawn uh, very sharply, perhaps. I'm relatively optimistic that uh, that we really are uh, in the process of creating a new world. Uh, the question really is how ugly is it going to have to get before we, uh, we before we wake up? And I'm afraid that the answer to that may be it's going to get really ugly, that there may be a great deal of death and destruction over the next 30 to 50 years. But maybe not. Maybe we'll wake up soon enough to avoid some of the more horrible scenarios. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident that on the other side of whatever tribulations are coming, we will be a new planet and a new species. Yeah, yeah. Let me share one more idea with you, because I think this is, this is an important part of at least the way I think about things in my story. I don't see it as a, as a war between the old way and the new way, or that the old way is bad and that the new way is good. I use a biological metaphor of metamorphosis. That a caterpillar turns into a butterfly, and that's a process. That first you've got a caterpillar, a, a good caterpillar with lots of legs and a big, fat, juicy body, and and it and it's going around, and all of the cells of its body are committed to doing caterpillar business. There are leg cells and skin cells and, you know, all these different cells doing what it takes to make the caterpillar a good, healthy caterpillar. And then the time comes for the caterpillar to turn into a butterfly. And literally, the caterpillar starts to fall apart. And it starts with one cell. At some point, every cell in the caterpillar's body is doing caterpillar business. And then one day, one cell somewhere starts doing some different stuff. And then Maybe that's the first one, and then there's another one, and then there's another one, and then eventually there's a whole bunch of stuff, and it looks like the caterpillar's falling apart. But the caterpillar isn't bad, and the caterpillar isn't wrong. The caterpillar is the caterpillar, and it has its time, and then its time is over, and the time for the butterfly is here. And so that's the way I kind of view this, and that we, all of us people, most of the people on the planet right now are still doing caterpillar business, and that's okay. I mean, it's important that the caterpillar doesn't fall apart too quickly, or if it does, there won't be a butterfly. So the process has to proceed in an organized way, or at least in a way that permits the whole process to go forward. But there's a growing number of us now who are doing butterfly business and who are not interested in the caterpillar anymore and want to participate in creating the butterfly. But we don't have to be against the caterpillar for that or say that the caterpillar is wrong. Uh, we should support the caterpillar, actually. We want the caterpillar to keep doing its job while we're busy building the butterfly. It's important to remember that uh, at the end of the summer, if you go out into your yard, you are likely to see a couple of chrysalises that never became butterflies. That does happen. Something went wrong, and the caterpillar did fall apart, but yeah. Yeah. there wasn't a butterfly. <laughs> and there are no guarantees for us here. I'm optimistic, personally. I think, I don't know what odds, but I'd say, you know, way up in the 90s, I'd say I'm pretty sure that this is a healthy Earth and it's doing its thing just right. But there aren't any guarantees, so we do have to pay attention, I think. Yeah. We are, obviously, uh, doing massive damage to the Earth, but the Earth will fix itself. It's us that are going well, to... Well, I'm, I'm not even sure it's really damage. 
we're changing it. For sure, we're changing it. Let me tell you another story then, okay, about the first great ecological disaster on this planet. There was a time when the highest life form on this planet was anaerobic bacteria. They're single-celled bacteria. There was no oxygen in the atmosphere. It was a methane, probably. They don't know for sure, but they think it was pretty much a methane atmosphere and anaerobic bacteria. And anaerobic bacteria formed these huge mats, sometimes meters thick. Billions and trillions of these one-celled bacteria clumped together in these huge mats. And that was the highest form of life on this Earth. And then something happened and some weird shit started to happen called blue-green algae. And blue-green algae were very different than bacteria, and they gave off oxygen as a product of their metabolism. But oxygen is a deadly poison to anaerobic bacteria. Anaerobic means no oxygen. That's what it means. And these blue-green algae started to reproduce and give off oxygen, and the oxygen was killing the dominant life form on the planet. And eventually, of course, the blue-green algae dominated, and there still are anaerobes. They live in, some of them live inside your intestines in an environment where there is no oxygen. Some of them live deep underground, and they still are around, but evolution left them behind. And one of the reasons is that the metabolism, anaerobic metabolism, Metabolism is a very low energy metabolism and aerobic oxygen metabolism is a high energy reaction that allowed multicellular organisms to sh take shape. Anaerobes could never have formed multicellular organisms because of the limitations of the amount of energy that is released in their metabolism. Blue-green algae and their descendants were able to start forming multicellular life forms. You and I are the descendants of the smog creatures. They wiped out 99% of life on the planet so that evolution could proceed. So if they had had an EPA around back then, they would have put those blue-green algae out of business right away, and we'd all still be very happy anaerobic bacteria. So my heart and my sympathies are with you. I hate it when I see the destruction of uh, environment and what's happening to the rainforest and the animals and, and the polluted water and all that shit. I hate that stuff. I, I love to see a pristine planet. But I also understand that maybe we don't really know what's going on here. Maybe we're here uh, at this time of transition when the old way is disappearing and a new way is emerging. And we don't understand yeah. it. Yeah. I love this Charles Darwin quote, and I can't remember the exact word for word, but it's, you know, it goes, it's not the strongest of species that survives, nor is it the most intelligent, but the ones that are most responsive to change. Hence, you know, when you, you were saying that um, when from the anaerobic bacteria, not died off, but got overtaken by blue-green algae, <coughs> blue-green algae were able to respond to the change, whereas the yeah, anaerobic bacteria wasn't. And yeah. Well, actually, the, the blue-green algae actually instigated the change. They not only responded to it. Well, there was a little bit of both, actually. It's not quite that simple. And actually, I need to study that a little more. I mean, I got the general outlines correct, but I wouldn't want to get quizzed by somebody who was really knowledgeable. No, no. <laughs> yeah, I'd be in yeah. trouble, probably. <laughs> Well, when I see Earth as a living organism undergoing metamorphosis and assuming it's healthy and it's doing what it should be doing, we've been through a number of mass extinctions in the geological record. That's, I mean, there have been four or five of them when more than 70% of the species on the planet were eliminated. And here we are. I mean, it's clear we're in a mass extinction right now. There's no doubt about it. We are in one of those mass extinctions. We're losing lots of species every day now. And we don't even know really what we're losing. But the Earth has been through this uh, many times. So I'm just sort of trusting that Earth is healthy. And uh, if I don't understand it, well, that's my own lack of understanding. Yeah. Uh, it's 3 o'clock in the morning now. So <laughs> as much as I would love to continue this... I'm, I'm really no, that's okay. I'm, I'm ready to go on to the next thing. Thanks, Tom.